Okay, good evening. The big hand is on the 12th, so we will call to order the regular meeting of the Whitefish Planning Board, May 18th, 2023. Um, the first item on our agenda is a call to order and a roll call, but we are going to suspend the roll call in honor of uh, Kenny, who is no longer with us. She is off in her retirement. So uh, for the record, I will just mention that um, Scott Freudenberger, Toby Scott, and Chris Gardner are not here this evening. Is that good, Wendy? Okay. Um, the first item on the agenda are agenda changes. Um, anybody want to change the order of anything tonight? Okay. Uh, so we won't, <coughs> we won't change anything. Uh, the next item is approval of the minutes from the April 20th meeting. Can I get a motion, please? I'll move to approve the minutes from April 20th. A second. Okay. Um, any discussion or changes to those? Okay, those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. And the, pass the motion passes unanimously. Uh, item D is our next item on the agenda, communications from the public for items not on the agenda. We do have two public hearings advertised for this evening. Uh, if you would like to speak about anything that is not related to either one of those, please come up and state your name and address for the record. Okay, seeing no one, we will move on to unfinished business, which there is none, and uh, we will now move on to our public hearings. Our first public hearing is WPUD 23-01, a request by Kara Whitefish Investment uh, to amend their PUD. And this one is Wendy. Yeah. Good evening. Um, so before you is a third amendment to the planned unit development um, for the 95 Caro project, which you folks have seen a number of times since about 2018, if you've been on planning board that long. Um, this request is to establish reduced setbacks and increase lot coverage across the project. Again, this project was originally approved in January of 2018 and has had a series of amendments um, that I've identified in the report. Um, since that time, the applicant has been working toward final plat and meeting conditions. They've done a significant amount of grading and removal of debris and are working on some of their underground utilities, as I understand right now. Um, at the time of the original um, subdivision, there was limited detailed information showing the exact dimensions and locations of buildings on the various lots. Um, and over the past few years, the actual building design development um, has been taking place, which has necessitated the current amendment. Um, the purpose of these amendments is to maintain a cohesive urban influenced community in keeping in character with the original intent of the project. Um, so they are requesting a five foot structural setback with zero foot lot line setbacks on awnings and roofs, 60% lot coverages on lots three, four, five, six, and parts of seven, and then 80% on lot eight. This is a mixed use PUD because there's residential and commercial projects in, in the development. Um, the existing zoning is WT3 and a WIT with a PUD overlay, and the setbacks and lot coverage have more of a suburban type feel, which is not really quite what the development was intended to be. Um, they have some previously approved zoning deviations, including parking, exceeding building footprints, and then using the PUD process from years past instead of the CUP. Um, the public benefits that they have provided all along, which are unchanged, are public trails, public access to the river, access to open space within the development, and then public parking for the Great Northern Veterans Peace Park, and these benefits are unchanged with this particular request. Um, we did notice adjacent landowners, place a legal in the paper, notice advisory agencies, and we haven't received any comments. Um, because this project's been reviewed under previous PUD, most of the conditions are unchanged from previous requests. Um, just to hit some of the highlights here. Um, and again, um, you know, they are requesting reduced setbacks, increased lot coverage across the development. And we believe that um, the community benefits outweigh the request. They're still maintaining public access, public facilities, additional rights away, and then the overall design. So we are recommending approval of this request subject to the original conditions of approval that have been approved over the years. Um, and then I apologize for that kind of last minute change to the staff report. Um, at the time, I think we thought that um, tying some sort of maintenance agreement with this PUD was going to be the suitable approach, but after discussing it a little bit further, we're going to go a different way, but that'll be brought forward to the council at some later date. 
can answer any questions for you. Questions for Wendy? Uh, I have a question for you. Does increasing the lot coverage area, how much does that affect the overall open space of the project? The open space is unchanged. So it's just on the individual private lots um, that the setbacks and lot coverage changes. The overall lot um, open space, which is more than 30%, is still remains. Okay. It's all along the river and kind of in between all the buildings and individual lots. So that stays the same. Okay. So none of that. None of that is impacted. Affects the. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's all I have. Anybody else have questions? Okay, we'll open, for, open the public hearing and hear from the applicant if you have anything more to tell us or we might have some questions for you, Casey. Casey Malmquist, 160 Walker Creek Lane, Whitefish. Um, good evening all. <clears throat> yes, uh, I, as long as I've got a little time here, I did want to give a little bit of update. I know this project has taken some time, <clears throat> but we are actively um, involved in the project. We've got all of the deep or wet utilities in, so sewer water, storm water, all of that is in. We're currently doing the dry utilities and moving into hardscape paving um, into June and July and with an anticipation of final plot in August as uh, predicted. Um, I, I do, I mean, one of the things I wanted to speak to, as you, you guys know, PUDs are sort of flexible and a little bit, uh, you know, dynamic, fluid. Um, we have continued to work with staff throughout this whole thing, and therefore our multiple, uh, you know, presences before you. I think this is the fourth time now. But one of the things I wanted to point out is, unlike a typical plat development, or in most cases, PUDs, we're taking a little more curated approach here. Rather than developing something and just going out and selling it, we're actually working with people that are involved with the project and kind of developing it in those stages to truly optimize the project and to bring the best and the most out of it. When we last came to you, we did an amended plat, and at that time we were sort of focused on the civil or the horizontal work, and therefore we did a, a plat amendment to kind of adjust the lot lines. Once we got to that point, then we were focusing more on the vertical or the architectural component. And in that process, a couple things were revealed. One is the amended plat never got conveyed into the PUD, so we, we have to bring that plat, those lot lines now into this current PUD. So that's part of the reason we're here. But I think the more important part is in the architectural development, we were able to find what I would call opportunities for outdoor spaces on the buildings, uh, relationships to each of the buildings. This isn't just a bunch of things cobbled together. All of these buildings and sites we're looking at is working together. So those are the opportunities we explored in this. The, the deviations are pretty, pretty minimal. I think we're asking for 10% more on lot coverage. As stated, it does not impact open space at all. We have a significant amount of open space. So these are truly what we feel are improvements to the development, and I appreciate the ability to be heard on these, and I hope you guys appreciate our transparency, and <clears throat> we really wanted to make sure that everyone knew exactly what we're doing and why. <clears throat> I've got a couple of folks here on our consulting group that are happy to ask any technical questions, so if there are questions for me or others, please let us know. Thanks, Casey. Any questions for Casey? I'm just curious with the zero foot setback with awnings and uh, common space lot lines, how does snow falling affect that? <laughs> I don't know if, if there's any concern there with everything coming right to a public space as far as a roof line or an awning. Yeah, and, and Scott can probably speak more specifically to where that occurs. As I understand, it's just in, in one building, but um, those projections, you know, particularly an awning, is not. It's going to be a seasonal thing and would not be okay. up in the winter. But it's a good question. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. 
Thanks. Scott can address it in more detail if you'd like. Okay. My only question is, how do they make that gravel pile so dang high? How do they push that stuff up so high? I don't get it. Big machines. <laughs> Uh, okay, any other questions for Casey? Thanks, Casey. Scott, do you want to come up and address that question? This is Scott Eldon, 444 O'Brien, founding partner at Montana Creative. And I'm speaking on behalf of Aaron Wallace, AIA, my partner, who's um, out of town with softball or hockey or who knows what he's doing. So, um, in terms of that setback question, the um, Awnings and overhangs had to do with the original intent of the project, which at the time was meant to be like another little form of downtown, which has zero lot setbacks and actually has overhangs over the sidewalks. And as in this case, in any case, any, any landowner or any development needs to be mindful of their runoff water, uh, any hazards that would drip onto the public way and so forth. So in each case, if ever there is an awning that would go to zero lot line, that drip water would have to be maintained or snow stops if there's a slide or anything like that. And that would just be a standard order of procedure. Um, but it's a good observation. The five foot setback then is kind of a way that with city staff was determined to say, look, uh, around the whole perimeter of the entire lot, you've got these lots inside and they're all within the purview of the, of the development. But by setting a standard of five foot kind of organizes it more towards that urban intention that was set aside, you know, set it, set forward in the original PUD intent. So, any other kind of architectural related questions? Any other technical questions for Scott? Okay, we're letting you guys off easy tonight. Steve, can I point something out? Well, that's loud. Absolutely. Um, just so everyone's aware, um, while this subdivision is open to the public, all of the utilities, all of the roadways, all the sidewalks are privately owned and maintained. And so the entire property is private. There isn't public right of way. Um, so the, the property owner will be responsible for maintaining snow removal throughout the subdivision. Thanks, Craig. That helps. Yeah, sure. Come on up. Heard me. There's only one place where we're actually as designed now, um, doing the five foot. And when it comes to the awnings, with this development, <clears throat> particularly like you look at building number 10, the setback is to the street. So never does that, uh, like an awning projection, occur between two buildings. It's really an encroachment on the sidewalk. And that's another thing we did when we first set out the lot lines is we put the lot line on the inside of the sidewalk versus the outside. And we, we could move that, but it doesn't seem necessary because it really doesn't accomplish anything. But there wouldn't be any conflict between two buildings with this. So. All right, thanks Casey. Feel comfortable with that? Okay. Um, does so anybody else wish to speak on this matter? We will open the public hearing. Or does anybody else from your team have anything they want to add? No? Okay, great. If we have other questions, we'll call you back up um, after public comment. So we will open public comment period. Does anybody wish to speak on, uh, on this matter? For those of you arriving late, we are discussing the Caro Whitefish Investment uh, Planned Unit Development on North Caro. Anybody else wish to speak on this matter? Okay, we'll pl close the public comment and bring it back to the board for a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, recommend WPUD 2301 for approval. I'll second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Would you like to speak to your motion? It's been interesting to watch this kind of go through the stages, and I'm excited to see what you guys come up with. And thank you for being organized and bringing things back after you work. I like the idea of working as you go together to see a vision instead of kind of doing it and then waiting for people to come. So thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, then those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, this will be on the June 5th 
agenda for the City Council, so our next meeting. Okay, that brings us to WPUD 22-04, a uh, request by Ruiz Texco LLC for a planned unit development to develop 146 unit multifamily project in seven buildings. Again, this is Wendy. Do you need a minute, Wendy, or are you good? Okay. I, think I got it. If you All guys right. can see that site plan up there. Um, okay, are we ready? Um, so the request before you is a planned unit development for multifamily development between Colorado and Texas avenues. The applicant is proposing a residential PUD um, to develop 146 rental apartments that are a mix of one and two bedroom in seven buildings on six and a half acres. Um, this property is between Texas and Colorado, north of Edgewood. The gross density of the site is 22.3 dwelling units per acre. 30% of the apartments or 44 units will be deed restricted for permanent affordability. Access to the site is via private driveways on both the east and west sides of the property. One is off of Colorado and two are off of Texas. Um, bicycles and pedestrians will tr circulate through the project on sidewalks that connect through the project through a parking lot that contains 280 parking spaces. Um, both Colorado and Texas have buildings that front on the street, um, while the larger buildings are located toward the center of the project. The building fronting on Texas Avenue has 16 units and is two-story. Um, the proposed building fronting on Colorado has 10 units and is three-story and includes community space for the residents, including a management office, bike storage, and other common areas. The five central buildings are three-story with 24 units in each building. Throughout the site are open space areas, including green areas around buildings, and then three larger open space areas, including along Waverly um, and a community space near Colorado and in between the buildings near Texas Avenue. The applicant is requesting one zoning deviation to provide parking in the side yard setback. The zoning regulations say that uncovered open air parking is not permitted in a side or rear yard setback for four plexes or greater when adjacent to single family use or zone. Um, the side yard setback for the WR4 is 15 feet and the WR2 is 10 feet and the applicant is requesting five feet. In exchange for the zoning deviation, the applicant is providing 30% um, deed restricted affordable housing. Um, there'll be 12 one bedroom and 32 two bedrooms serving an area median income of 60 to 80% with an average of 70%. The actual rents would be determined at the time of deed restriction for the current year. As part of the project, they're also um, taking advantage of some of the legacy home incentives, including um, which if they're volunteering to provide housing, they automatically are eligible for these items. Um, they're getting a little additional building height of up to 40 feet, but not greater than three stories. Um, reduced parking for two bedroom unit or greater. Um, the off street standard um, parking would require 306 parking spaces um, and they are providing um, 280. The, with the incentive they could have as low as 256. They're also using the 20% density bonus. Um, with that 20% density bonus, they could have up to 167 units, and they're proposing, again, 146. Again, the properties are between Texas and Colorado. There are five parcels. Um, the, there are some residential structures and outbuildings on the property that will be removed. The properties are zoned WR4 on the western half and then WR2 on the eastern half. The properties are surrounded by residential uses and served by all public services and facilities. Um, staff noticed adjacent landowners on April 25th. Um, we noticed advisory agencies, put a legal in the paper. We also put the full application on the city's webpage on April 21st or April 24th. Um, we did receive comments in support and with concerns. Um, folks were concerned with the loss of community character, locating multifamily um, only on the west half, uh, loss of trees, uh, concerns with outdoor lighting, high groundwater, traffic, um, loss of wildlife, increased noise, loss of privacy, and increased density. Um, I also received some additional comments, which I stuck up there on the dais after the packet went out, um, and many of their concerns were similar to ones we received. Um, we review PDs according to the criteria in the zoning regulations. 
Um, there are no water bodies, streams, or wetlands on the property. The area is mapped as having potentially high groundwater, as most of Whitefish does. Um, as such, they'll be required to conduct high groundwater monitoring during the high groundwater monitoring season, according to the city's engineering standards, and that will be put into the engineering analysis when the engineering plans come forward, if the project's approved. Um, the area has not been identified as crucial habitat. However, it's very likely that deer, bear, and other animals move through this area as they do throughout town and will continue to do so th after the development. Um, the project will be required to have bear-proof garbage cans as it is required everywhere else in town. Um, staff did notify Fish, Wildlife, and Parks of this application but did not receive any comments. Um, staff will recommend a condition of approval that tree preservation plan in compliance with the new landscaping chapter is submitted for review. Such plan will identify healthy trees to be retained and method for tree protection during construction. Um, under open space, so the PUD chapter requires 30% open space. However, if one's providing affordable housing, that can be reduced down to 20%. And so the applicant is providing almost one and a half acres of open space, which is about 22% open space. Um, the three main areas, um, there's an area number two, which is on the east side of the building that's fronting on Colorado Avenue, and it's 5,669 square feet. Area four, located off Waverly Place, is 8,881 square feet. And then there's an area near the eastern edge um, that's 18,062 square feet. All the areas show landscaping and paths and tot lots, and they're all connected to one another with sidewalks um, and adjacent rights away. Um, rem remaining open space areas are scattered throughout the project, meeting the minimum standards in the PUD chapter, including availability, res residence, and dimensional requirements. Um, the project's layout and design, along with the building scale and massing and open space or strategies the applicant is using to integrate the project into the existing neighborhood. Um, the layout of the project places smaller buildings along the street and less massive buildings towards the center of the project, in addition to the open space areas. Um, I put a map on page eight of my staff report showing where some of the other multifamily developments are in the neighborhood. So while this is gonna be one of the larger projects in that neighborhood, it is an area that has multifamily type projects. Um, under street continuity, um, there's no public or private streets are being provided or proposed within the development. Um, the entire project is being served with a parking lot and drive aisles connecting the two streets, but that kind of mimics the grid system that's developed in that neighborhood. The existing unimproved alley to the south of this project will remain unimproved because um, this project doesn't need it for access, so it'll stay as it is. A TIS was completed for the project, and at complete build out, um, the project would generate 65 a.m. peak hour trips and 79 p.m. peak hour trips. Um, two intersections identified in the study will have level of service C or less with or without the project. 80% um, of the traffic generated on site will travel to the downtown, and the remaining 20% will be split between Wisconsin and Edgewood. The TIS does not recommend any additional mitigation for the project, but does suggest a retiming of the intersection at Edgewood and Wisconsin to help improve the level of service. Um, MDT also reviewed the application and they shared the concern about the signal at Edgewood and Wisconsin. Um, in addition, the city entered into a third party agreement with a traffic engineer to have them review this TIS and they agreed with the findings concerning Edgewood and Wisconsin. So we did recommend a condition of approval that they work with MDT on the timing of that intersection. Um, no frontage improvements are required on Colorado Avenue as it was reconstructed by the city a number of years ago. There is a shared use path on the west side of Colorado Avenue. Um, curb and gutter is on the east side. And as we've required for other projects on the east side of Colorado, we'd like to have them provide a safe pedestrian crossing over to the west side so folks can get into downtown. Um, no frontage improvements are required on Texas Avenue either as it was constructed here in the last couple of years with the shared use path on the west side of Texas Avenue. Um, and that project's finishing up right now and we'll have street lights and landscaping and curb and gutter. Um, and we'll ensure that the sidewalks within the project all connect up with this shared use path. Um, the development 
uh, will encourage transportation alternatives because of the pedestrian connections throughout the project. Um, this project is well situated to take advantage of all the city's shared use paths and bike paths. Um, it is an infill project with easy pedestrian and bicycle access to downtown schools and commercial areas. Um, the project is providing one type of housing, multifamily apartments, in seven varied buildings. Um, again, the buildings on the outside of the project are a little smaller um, in size and mass, and then the center buildings, while the same size and have the same number of units, are varied in look with an overall complementary design. Um, Public Works has reviewed the preliminary water, sewer, and stormwater information. Um, sewer will be extended to each building from the alley on just south of the project there. And then water will be looped through from Colorado to Texas Avenue. Sewer from this project goes to the Colorado lift station and Public Works has asked that as part of the engineering plan review um, that a capacity analysis take place of that lift station. Um, as I mentioned previously, groundwater monitoring will occur during the um, season according to the engineering standards and then that data is part of the design of the project. Um, the project is split by two land use designations. There's high density residential on the west side and urban on the east. And it does comply with the growth policy and it is an infill project which has been a big priority of that 2007 um, growth policy. Uh, we reviewed it according to the multifamily development standards and just to hit some of the highlights there, um, we want to make sure that the parking lot lighting meets the standards to ensure it's dark sky compliant and that there's secure bike parking. They're providing secure bike parking, but we'd like to see a little bit more at each of the buildings. So we are recommending a condition for a minimum of four outdoor parking spaces per building because there's parking, secure parking in the community center space. Um, the applicant's not propo proposing fencing around the majority of the project except for around the home on Texas Avenue. Um, in order to protect neighbors from vehicle headlights, we'd recommend a low fence or wall along the edges of the parking lot. Um, we want to ensure that lighting not only is dark sky compliant but does not shine into neighboring property owners, um, neighboring properties. Um, so staff will recommend a condition of approval to review cut sheets and other design materials of the proposed fixtures to ensure that the standard is met. Trash facilities, of course, now are required to be um, screened as well. Uh, as far as the open space, we've also recommended a condition of approval to review the landscaping for the entire project, which will include details on the open space development. Um, so while this project was submitted prior to the adoption of the most current land landscaping chapter, which was just at council meeting last week, I believe, um, we review landscaping plans at the time of building permits. So this project will fall under the new landscaping chapter. Um, a couple of the most significant changes um, between the two landscaping chapters and what they're proposing is um, making sure that they have enough uh, landscaping islands within a parking lot and then the tree retention regulations. Um, so we are required rec recommending a condition of approval that even though they're asking for a deviation for that allowing parking in that side yard setback, they have not asked for a deviation to um, put from the landscaping installation. So those landscaping requirements will still be required within that five foot area and as well as the low wall that we are recommending. Um, both the police and fire department have reviewed the proposal and they found that they can adequately serve the pro property. The project's in city limits, it has hydrants, the buildings will be sprinklered, emergency access to the site is met, and the buildings will be constructed and inspected according to the building code. Um, in addition, the city is part of a countywide emergency management plan which identifies and designates roles and responsibilities for the various types of incidents, including which jurisdiction is the lead on different types of incidences. Um, an emergency evacuation is incident specific um, and is phased and depending on the type of incident, different entities are the lead. So again, in exchange for the reduced um, to be able to park in the side yard setback, they are providing 44 deed restricted rental units that will serve 80 to 60 to 80% area median income with an average of 70%. Um, you'll recall the 2022 housing needs assessment identified 800 rentals of which 580 must be below market to serve the residents and local businesses in Whitefish by 2030. So this 44 would go a long way to supporting those numbers. 
So staff believes they've demonstrated clear community benefit to deviate from the adopted standard in exchange for the 44 rentals. So we are recommending approval of the project um, and recommend the deviation for, to zoning be granted subject to 11 conditions of approval. Um, just to hit some of the highlights, again, we asked them to do a capacity analysis of the Colorado lift station. We asked them to install a crosswalk and improve the pedestrian ramp on Colorado Avenue. Uh, work with MDT to improve the timing of the intersection signal at Edgewood and Wisconsin. And before submitting building permit applications, because we don't have a final plat, so we kind of use this as sort of our final plat to make sure all the things are done. Um, we want to review the outdoor lighting. Uh, make sure there's tree protection involved with the trees that they are saving. Um, they need to aggregate the lots because five lots and we're asking them to turn it into one. The final acceptance of all improvements by public works including um, paving water, sewer and stormwater needs to be complete. Architectural review needs to be obtained. Landscaping plan with a low wall no taller than four feet around the edges of the parking lot. Deed restriction for the 44 apartments and a minimum for short-term parking spaces for bikes at each building. Can I answer any questions for you? Thanks, Wendy. Uh, questions for Wendy? No? Okay, I have a few. Uh, I thought I read in there that, there is a, that they're also asking for a 40-foot height um, right. deviation. But that's not... Um, as you'll recall, if someone's providing affordable housing, there's a list, kind of a menu of things that they can select from. And a 40 foot building height is one of those items you okay. can automatically get if you're providing affordable housing. Okay, so that's not a... It's not, an, it's not a zoning deviation per zoning se deviation. through the PD. <clears throat> okay, so the only zoning deviation is the... Parking in the side the yard and setback. Okay. Yep. Um, and then <clears throat> they were asking them to work with MDT about Edgewood in Wisconsin, but in the um, transport in the traffic study, it mentioned that Second and Baker is also a problem as well. Why did we keep? Why did we leave that out of the right of the conditions of approval? I think we've already done that timing, as I understand. Are you talking about signal timing? Well, yeah, in the traffic study, it said that timing, that the level of service could be increased at Second and Baker as well as Edgewood and Wisconsin by working with the timing of the light. Is that something that's already been done at Second and Baker? I know that MDT has worked on the <coughs> signals along Highway 93 at Second and Baker and um, Second and Spokane uh, somewhat tirelessly over the last decade or so. Um, and I know that we may get some more information from um, Whipple, the, the traffic engineer. I, I believe there was some correspondence with MDT as they were doing the study and there's simply no more capacity to be earned um, through adjusting <laughs> Second and Baker. Okay, uh, all right. Um, and then the, what is your, what's your take on the, the lift station service? It, it's going to need some upgrades. Okay. And who would be on the hook for that then? If uh, The developer would, but we just haven't gone through that analysis yet. So as part of the final engineering plans, they'll do a de detailed um, collection summary of, of, you know, what's coming into that lift station currently and what they'll be adding, and then we'll be looking at upgrades. Okay. Uh, and then one more question for you, Craig. There's We got a letter today about um, placing some of the fill or whatever they took out to when they were working on Edgewood in Texas. Uh, was that was that stuff put on that property during the... Yeah, it's my understanding that the property owner had an agreement with the contractor that was working for the city uh, to take some of that fill as part of their final um, grading design for this project. So um, there is excess fill on that property right now that will be incorporated into their final grading plan. Okay, and... If that backs water up onto somebody else's property, what's the, what's the recourse there? Well, the final grading plan can't shed more water than currently um, pre-development comes off of that site. So um, we'll be reviewing that as part of the, you know, the final detailed engineering. Okay. And if that's happening now, what is the, what's the recourse well, for the homeowner? Those plans don't 
uh, get submitted until after the preliminary plat is approved or the PUD is approved. And so nothing's happening right now. I know that there's been communications between property owners and um, this developer about what's happening. And from what I understood, there have been mitigations to um, reduce that runoff. But I, I don't know the current situation. I haven't seen the letter from today. Okay. And is there any, anything that they can file with the city to have the city go out and look at it and determine if the developers acted in bad faith or Yeah, just absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the fill that was taken from that site was part of the Edgewood project. And so, you know, the city is definitely, you know, has some liability in that. Okay. So for sure. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions for Wendy or other staff? Okay. All right, we will open the public hearing then and hear from first from the um, applicant. I think the mic is off. There we go. Is that better? Okay, great. Um, thank you for having us this evening. I'm Laurie Moffat Felberg. I'm Senior Vice President of Architecture for Dolan, Ar Dolan Group Architecture Planning and Interiors. We are the design architect for the project. And I will be making the presentation on behalf of the development team. Um, I got to tell you, though, Wendy made my job really easy because she and her, the rest of the city staff have been incredibly easy to work with. They've been very collaborative, and we appreciate all the time that they've spent with us um, working on this really nice new community for Whitefish. Um, so, Wendy, I guess if you could advance to the next slide. So, this is the site as um, she described, and we really took efforts to look at several things as we were contemplating how do we provide quality housing on this site. And a couple of things that I'll mention that um, weren't in the staff report. We, we specifically jogged the um, parking area you see along paralleling the alley and moved it around so we don't get cut through traffic. We didn't want to create yet another connection point that would encourage any cut through between Colorado and Texas. And so that's why we jogged around those two buildings on the southern side. It also gives us a place to plow snow. And so if you look at the ends coming in from the ends, all of the drive aisles have a blank spot that's just landscaping, there's no parking in them. And that's to pile snow. Um, I'm living up on Bozeman Pass and we had a heck of a snow winter. Um, so plowing snow was top of mind for me. And um, so that was some of the nuance that we really worked through as we worked on the site plan. She mentioned that we've created smaller buildings facing both Colorado and Texas. Uh, maybe if you could go to the next slide. So this is the Colorado side, the smaller building, and we turned the building so they have a narrow street presence from a massing standpoint facing the public roads. The smaller building, it is three, a three-story building, but it's very similar in scale to the other multifamily buildings along Colorado. And um, we set it way back from the street um, and to preserve some of the trees along that edge. We like that buffering that's already there today with the, the home that's there. So we pulled it inboard so we can keep some, some nice size landscaping there and then create this indoor-outdoor amenity space in the lower uh, portion of that building. I'll, I'll actually go through a floor plan of that later, but that's one of the outdoor areas um, that's in the open space. And then you can see the connection um, to the north there. It's really a city lot size. We didn't want to put architecture there. We really wanted to make that open space as a, as a friendly connection to the community. Um, it's a softer presence along that edge. 
and um, it's just kind of, you know, it's just fallow right now, but we really saw that as a, as a beautiful connection point to the, to the neighborhood to the north. Um, and then, as mentioned, all the sidewalks will connect through, so there's great connectivity. Next slide, please. On the Texas side, the city's done an awesome job with the um, pedestrian path along Texas Avenue and the upgrades along that street that are almost complete. And so the pedestrian co connection coming in from that side is important to us as well. And here again, we, we went with a narrow end. That building facing Texas is a two-story building, so we've stepped it down. Even though the density bonus would have allowed us to keep that three stories and make that a bigger building, we felt it was important to our connectivity to the neighborhood um, to bring that down to two stories. And then we have the central um, open space there between the two center buildings running north and south that really provides a great play area. Um, there'll be you know, wonderful outdoor space for the residents to take advantage of. And the reason we need the, um, we're asking for the parking variation is we wanted to push the buildings to the center of the site and let the parking create additional setback from the neighborhood. So it really pushes these buildings from a setback standpoint, other than those two that I commented on earlier, but these bigger buildings in the center, it pushes them you know, a good 80 feet away from the property line. So there's a significant setback created by having that parking on those edges that we felt was a better presence and better integration to the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So this is, this is in the staff report, but I thought it was worthwhile putting up. There is a um, significant amount of open space. We are over the 20%. Um, little tiny text up there. Um, I'd probably have to borrow somebody's glasses if you wanted me to read it off tonight. But um, it is dispersed throughout the community, so there's um, easy access for the residents to um, come out and use those areas. Next slide, please. So this is the view from the Colorado side. So you can see this is the smaller three-story building um, pushed back from the street frontage. We've pushed the parking inboard, so we have a really nice landscaped frontage along that edge. Um, next slide. And this is the ground floor of that building. So on the left-hand side are homes that would face out on Colorado. We did face the community area inboard so we can open it up to that open space on the inside. Um, so that allows it to flow in and out. You can see the um, completely secure indoor bike storage um, that is being provided, a maintenance shop area that we felt was important to have um, good access to maintenance for the community a couple of offices, and then the community area that really creates an indoor-outdoor experience for the residents to enjoy. Next slide. And then this is the view from the Texas side. So you can see the buildings are stepped down here. It's a two-story building. Again, the narrow, narrow side of the building facing Texas. And we worked really carefully on these buildings to create enough articulation in the roof lines and the massing of the units as they move in and out. So it really breaks it up. And then color and material changes happen to break up the face of the buildings. They're, they're related, so we, we see them as siblings. They're not all identical. And so we went with some of these shed roof areas on the corners, and then some buildings have the gable areas on the corners. There's a couple different color palettes. Um, we used a corrugated steel as a unifying element. Um, next slide, please started talking about materials, I could talk to the material page. Um, but high quality materials on the exterior and then the variety of forms, um, material changes, materials changing at inside corners, so they make visual sense, really breaks up the, um, the dynamic of, of the, uh, the buildings themselves. So that's the end of my presentation. I guess we have one more slide. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, um, but thank you. Thank you, Lori. Any questions for Lori about the general layout or anything else? I don't think I have any either. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, is another member of your team going to give a presentation, or is that it? No, you just get me tonight. Okay. All right. So we will open the public hearing, and those of you who would wish to speak on this matter, please come up, form a line, come up, state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, also keep in mind that we do have 
Uh, it looks like several people want to comment tonight, so if you could co keep your comments to about three minutes, that would be wonderful. Um, and don't be shy. If nobody wants to come up, I will close the public hearing. So come on up. My name is <coughs> Doug Rhodes, and I live in Whitefish. And my family owns a house just um, on Waverly, just to the north, just to the north of the project there. And my biggest concern is that there's no buffer between the backyard of that house and the parking lot. And I think that, you know, in order to do a PUD, if you look at the restrictions on a PUD, it's pretty clear that you need to provide some amenities to the community. And in order to get that kind of density in that neighborhood. So there's a lot of single family residences over there. And I think we're just concerned about, you know, traffic cars coming in at night, engines. Uh, there is a high water table there. So I'm concerned about water. And I think it's good that they're going to provide 20% of uh, housing. That's, that's very good. And I support that. But I think it's a very dense uh, project, and I'd like to see more landscaping and a buffer between the existing residences. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Hey, my name's Todd. I, uh, I'm on 809 Waverly. Um, I just have a couple concerns about the development. I, I did want to state that I, I do think that we need affordable housing. I support affordable housing. I've lived in employee housing. I've lived in income restricted housing. I've had five roommates. Um, I've surfed on couches through the years and eventually got married and solved all my problems here. But um, <laughs> no, my primary concerns are really just three of them. Uh, one is just the nature of rezoning this. You know, if I understand it correctly, it seems like this property can already be built fairly densely uh, using that multifamily, two family residential zoning. Uh, if you look at it, the additional concern is integration with this neighborhood. Uh, if you look at it from that two or multifamily density, most of the homes on Waverly, uh, on you know Texas, and then on Edgewood, maybe single two-story homes, single family garages, um, lawns, those type, type of things. So a 40-foot tall, 35 to 40-foot tall structure, three structures in the back that really doesn't kind of blend in with that neighborhood. I have additional concerns that come to mind when I hear things like, look at how far set back it is. We're going to use these materials to break it up. Uh, and just essentially trying to camouflage the buildings a little bit more than integrate them with the neighborhoods. And then three, uh, my only other concern uh, is just, I, I think the location is perfect. I do think that people would benefit from being able to walk, bike to town. Uh, people that live and work uh, close by can benefit from that as well. My only concern is just the winter. If anybody's tried to make that walk from Waverly to Safeway or the Wave, uh, you know, that, that, that main thoroughfare is usually pretty icy. And then once you get below the bridge on Baker, it's unplowed and just, I think that once the first big storm rolls through, most people are going to, you know, abandon the bikes or abandon walking. And then we're going to end up with 200, 250 cars idling, warming up because there's no covered parking. There's no protection from those resources. So. Those are just kind of my primary concerns. And again, I do think that this land needs to be developed. I think that providing affordable housing on this land is the way to do it. I just have concerns about the overall design and, and implications of the project here. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. My name is Cameron Blake, 825 Lexan Trail. And I'm here representing Flathead Families for Responsible Growth. FFRG is passionate about helping guide responsible growth that honors the safety and our quality of resources and retains our sense of community and character. While we all need to be conscious of the added congestion and egress issues north of the viaduct, FFRG supports this project as proposed with the affordable housing component and commitment and a satisfactory plan to address the stormwater runoff concerns raised by the neighbors. We want to commend the Whitefish Corridor Project for including affordable and workforce housing that's so needed in our Whitefish community. At the same time, we encourage the city to maintain a long view and look carefully and critically at any developer's request for exceptions which result in additional density. We strongly recommend that given the congestion already existing, the city must determine how much more development can take place north of the viaduct given the current and foreseeable status of our transportation system. 
um, this is one of the issues that will define the future of whitefish. And I just personally, I want to say, I think they did a really good job with the site design and the building massing and design to break it up and um, separate it from the street. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. My name is Clay Binford at 260 Texas Avenue. Um, I would echo a lot of the same things. This is not a not in my backyard sort of uh, comment that I have right now. It's more of a concern specifically on the congestion uh, to the north, as many of these folks have expressed just the concept of more traffic coming across that bridge at any time, uh, even today going across uh, one way was, was a nightmare as it was. And so adding an additional 146 units on that side, um, whether it's through this or through future development, just that concept that right now the infrastructure does not seem to be able to uphold what we're looking to do as far as continuing to add um, add this type of housing density. So I would just encourage the council to look at that even closer as far as what are the different avenues that we could potentially go as far as addressing some of the congestion. Thank you. Thank you, Clay. Hi, Amy Boring, uh, 78 Montana Avenue, Whitefish. Um, I'm in support of this project. Um, I would like to throw out a few things to consider before plans are finalized. Um, the buildings, can, is there a way to pull up the east? Um, zoom in. No, go back one more. The other way. Yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, I feel like the building's placement that bumps up against Texas next to the half acre parcel is a bit much um, for the Texas Avenue neighborhood. It's pretty rural over there. And the fact that there's two driveways on each, or a driveway on each side, I think that is a little bit much. I just wonder if it can be reconfigured, like take the green space over here and put it in the corner and have like community garden. I think that would be cool um, and maybe Take the like the parking and run it across the back because there's old growth trees there, so it wouldn't be as prevalent to that property. I, it's just surrounded, and it feels icky to me. But like I said, I am totally for this project. I think it's much needed. Um, I think the concerns are valid on traffic at Wisconsin and Edgewood, and also just from a evacuation standpoint, like north of the viaduct, we're pretty isolated. Like, if something were to happen to the viaduct, we have Edgewood. That's it. So I think infrastructure is important before maybe building more in general. So, yeah, that's just my two cents. But I think we need to give this property a little bit of a break. That's kind of a lot. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having us. Thanks, Amy. Hi, and thank you, volunteers. Um, my name is Flower Bartholomew. I live at 27 Colorado Avenue, um, right across from where the parking lot would be. I don't know if you can show the north or the, uh, the Colorado end, if there's a slide there. It doesn't really matter, I guess. But um, um, my concerns are, um, yeah, one, bottleneck. When I used to live up uh, Northwoods Drive, it took me about 20 minutes to make a left <laughs> during ski season up there. And now being the house just um, south of this, i um, wondering how long it'll take me to make a left out of there now. Um, so traffic flow is one thing. Um, and also, yeah, uh, the, I love that there's the two-story on the other end of Texas, on the other end by Texas. And I would appreciate being the one of two houses. I'm actually one off the alley. I'm behind 49 Colorado. Um, to have a two-story smaller structure that I'm looking at would be a bonus for me. I realize that's a little, um, yeah, that's selfish, but uh, you know, I built my house 20 years ago and obviously there's gonna be changes, but um, yeah, there's that. And then privacy um, with that, all that massive parking right across from me, um, light shining right in my window without fencing 
um, that would be the, the other. And yeah, um, as well, groundwater issues. Um, with that big pad that was built, um, I had standing water in my crawl space all winter long. So those are, that's me, thanks. Thanks, Flower. Hello, my name is Brandy Lonco. I own the property at 734 Edgewood, uh, just south of the 16-foot alleyway. The page that you were just on, if we could go back to, uh, my property is right where it says 16-foot alley. Um, I think the 16-foot alley there is a little gracious, <laughs> well, especially with the aspen trees right there. Uh, my fence line does run along that alley. I have a huge concern with privacy into my backyard and into my two-story home, building a 35 to 40 foot structure immediately behind that property is going to be able to look into every window that is north facing on my home, uh, including my ground floor and the ground floor of these units because the pad of land that was built up when the construction of Edgewood was built is actually now several feet higher than where my ground floor sits. So uh, on page nine of the packet, you can actually see the fence of my property and you can see that that pad of uh, gravel and dirt is several almost flush with my six foot fence that is laying on the alley. Uh, I do definitely have a lot of concerns about the groundwater. Uh, as many people here have expressed, we had uh, last year standing water in our backyard. Our backyard actually dovetails to be able to provide some regulation of that water. We still had about six inches of standing water in that dovetail, as well as both of the neighbors on both sides had standing water in their unit on their property. Uh, definitely concerned about the congestion north of the viaduct in case of emergencies. Uh, as far as I heard from that gentleman over there, there's not really much more we can do about the lighting timing. Maybe are on second, uh, second Baker, but it, I mean it's it's bad guys <laughs> crossing over the viaduct even this evening at peak times, and that includes you know 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock in the morning and you factor ski season into there and other activities going on around town, it's gonna be four, five, six turns of each one of those lights. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm all for affordable housing and I think that there is a responsible way to do it. I think this property and this piece of land would be wonderfully developed if we could do it responsibly and making it f fit in more with the community, two-story homes, duplexes, something smaller, less. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Brady. Um, hi, I'm Patrick Davey. I live at 803 Waverly Place. <clears throat> if you could just go one more slide forward, please. Um, so my main issues are just uh, the high watermark that a lot of people have brought up. Um, you can almost see my house in the top left corner. That's my shed. Um, there's nothing built back there right now, but last spring there was an entire pond back there. Um, we had ducks living there for about a week. So I'm not sure what filling it with concrete and just paving over it's going to do to me and everyone else. If it's just going to push water into all of our yards or if it's just going to constantly be flooded above it. Um, and then also to hear that there's not going to be any fencing put up. Um, along that, it's just, I, I have a chain link fence already, but that, you know, I feel like there's just going to be, I have t total privacy that I think everyone else on that street enjoys. And just to be losing that, um, you know, I do agree affordable housing is something this place needs. Um, it's been an issue for over 10 years. Um, and this is going to provide some of that, but I just think there's small things that um, are being overlooked and just needs to get looked at a little bit more. Thanks, Patrick. Hello, my name is Mallory Phillips. I live at 937 Kalispell Avenue. I'm asking you to approve the Whitefish Corridor community. As a local with deep roots in the community, I'm proud to support this development. The main reasons I support this development is housing that is socioeconomically diverse. The development is located close to jobs, schools, recreation, and the snow bus. This location will 
reduce the need to have to work to drive for local workers, retirees, etc. With 57% of our workforce currently living outside of Whitefish, building housing for our community that is walkable, bikeable, busable is really important. They want to build deed restricted affordable housing that will be integrated throughout the buildings. The flexibility of where the units are located throughout this apart these apartments will help create more stability. If someone begins to make above the income limit set around the deed restricted affordable housing, they can remain in their apartment. The affordability requirement uh, will be transferred to the next open unit. This creates more housing stability and empowers community members to seek out jobs that will continue to lift them up economically without fear of losing their stable housing. This development is a piece of in a complex puzzle to work towards solving the housing crisis. We need, this, we need solutions that help people in the immediate right now, and we also need developments like this to ensure that we are thinking about how to house those in, in the future as Whitefish continues to grow. Housing isn't just about the roofs and walls or how pretty it looks like on the outside. It's about a building a strong and inclusive community. It's about ensuring that our grocery store clerks, nurses, service industry workers, <coughs> postal workers, folks on fixed incomes and more can live close to where they work and play and thrive alongside of us. Of course, I'm crying. This is what I do. Um, but supporting this development, we are not only addressing a pressing need, but also investing in the future of Whitefish, where more people have the opportunity to prosper and be part of our town's success story. I think it's also important that those who are concerned with the density in this area, I recommend that those people show up to the city council meetings and ask for zoning changes to see density to dispersed throughout our community. There is a lot of density here in this part of the uh, community, and I get that. Um, and so there are ways to get involved so that you have more gentle density throughout the entire community. Um, I also second what Amy said around adding community gardens to this project. Um, I think that's a really important part. Uh, so please, yes, vote yes on this. Thank you. Thanks, Mallory. Hey guys, good evening. Nathan Dugan, 937 Kalispell Avenue. I'm the president of Shelter WF. Um, just want to start with a simple question. If not here, then where? If we can't build multifamily housing that will provide countless homes to people in Whitefish just a half mile and a pretty easy walk from the center of our downtown core, then where can we build it? The answer to me is pretty obvious. It's going to be built on the outskirts of town where there are fewer neighbors, resulting in 100% of the people living there, getting in their cars every single day, creating more traffic and gridlock on all of our city streets. I do really feel for the neighbors in this neighborhood. They're carrying a significant housing burden compared to the anywhere else in the city. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that this is a downtown neighborhood, even if it's separated by just some railroad tracks. I personally think that we should be building like this in all directions from downtown. Um, but that starts with approving this request, the next one that's on the other side of the viaduct, the next one that's in a different direction, hopefully, and so on. This development will provide at least 44 real life people with permanently affordable homes. And we'll provide at least an additional 102 real life people with stable rental homes. Given that many units have multiple bedrooms, we're most likely talking about even more than 146 people being positively impacted. We're in the midst of a transition from winter to summer at the moment, a time when many people in Whitefish lose their housing and have to scramble to find something as the homes that they rent become more valuable as short term rentals or vacation homes for second homeowners who don't like our snowy and cold winters. That yearly cycle won't happen to people in the Whitefish Corridor community, and that's what I mean when I say stable. They don't get kicked out every summer because somebody wants to come visit or, or rent their place out. When I first moved to Whitefish in 2015, I had a lot of trouble finding a place to live. So much trouble that I ended up living at the Whitefish Bike Retreat for a month, waiting for the place where I'd signed a lease to open up, all while commuting into Kalispell for work. As a single person without any connections here yet, I ended up living near only. Uh, and still, in 2015, paid 900 bucks a month for my rent back then, and a heck of a lot more for gas, because I was working at the hospital in Kalispell. Although I loved that house, it wasn't my first choice uh, to live so far out of town. That's simply all I could find at the time without trying to coordinate roommates in a brand new city. It has only gotten more difficult and expensive to find rental housing over the past eight years, and developments like the Whitefish Corridor are needed to reverse this trend. Thank you for your time, and please vote to recommend approval of this proposal. Thanks, Nathan. Hi, I'm Glenn Phillips. I live at 115 Colorado Avenue. So I am right on the other side of that first little building. 
And so my concerns are some of the somewhat same as traffic. You know, it takes me half an hour to get to McDonald's sometimes. <laughs> but um, no, no, uh, no fencing between the back of that building and my building, my house. I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose light. I'm not worried about the, you know, lighting for the parking lot. Uh, my southern facing light I'm going to lose and I don't know how it's going to uh, you know affect the value of my house so I have some concerns I would love some transparency and like let I want to be I want to know what's going on and it kind of the letter in the mail just kind of scared me so I like the idea of the affordable I love that idea but I'm um, considering I got mine through an affordable housing project as well. So I, I like that idea, but I think it's too dense, and I'm very concerned about how it's going to affect me personally. Thank you very much. Thanks, Glenn. Hi, my, my name is Lena Camaro. I live in Kalispell. Um, I'm a homeowner and a mom, and I'm here because I have a lot of friends and family that live in Whitefish and work in Whitefish and no longer get to live in Whitefish because they've lost their houses and they still, they want to live here, they want to work here, and um, I'm just, I want to speak in, in support and hope that you guys approve this housing plan. I agree with all of the issues that I've heard people bring up as a homeowner who lives uh, right behind uh, arguably like one of the two big apartment buildings in Kalispell. Like I know the feeling. These are real concerns. But it sounds like everybody that has those concerns is still very pro-affordable housing. And I think that everybody would agree that we need those houses now. We need them yesterday. We need them five years ago. So I hope that you guys listen to all the concerns that people have. I hope you address them because they are very real. And I hope that that doesn't stop this from being built. And I hope that we still get the affordable housing that we need. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. Hello, my name is Leonette Galaz. I live at 265 Colorado Avenue, uh, apartment D4, which is actually Big Mountain Apartments. And it's right outside of, I think, oh yeah, actually, I think you can see it. That's my building. Um, so uh, I guess I bring that up to um, just kind of think about the idea that there, there is density in this neighborhood. Um, I live in it, and, uh, and I, it, like, it works um, from what I can tell and from what I, I experience living in that neighborhood. It seems to work really well. You are really distracting. <laughs> um, I think what I am here to do, though, is um, working as a community organizer in the Flathead right now, I wanted to bring some of the larger context of what Whitefish is a part of, which is the Flathead Valley. Um, we, I think the community sometimes like to silo themselves, but they actually heavily, heavily impact each other. And one of the biggest issues happening in the Flathead right now um, that we don't talk about when we talk about affordable housing is homelessness and what's happening in Kalispell. And there is a connection to that and what's happening in Whitefish. So I want everybody to, you know, take some, the community to take some deep, hard looks at what are the costs um, you know, that we incur when we, um, when we stifle uh, high-density development in infill communities where there should be denser development so that we can deal with the crisis that's happening in the Flathead Valley. We're not alone. Um, and we're heavily interconnected with one another. And, uh, and I encourage people to think of how decisions surrounding this particular community, because it's just one of many developments that have come up and um, not worked and in the past not worked out. I hope this one does. Um, how that impacts things on a, on a larger scale, beyond just whitefish and beyond ourselves. Uh, thank you, and I encourage approval, and I hope that you know, some of everybody's concerns can be taken into account uh, as much as possible. Thanks. Thanks, Leonette. Hi, my name is Lauren Walker, and I live at 155 Fauna Road. And I'm having a little deja vu here. I feel like this is a similar scenario that we've seen before, specifically, um, I guess it was last year, um, with the development that was meant to go in at the head of the lake at the turnoff for Big Mountain. And most of the objections to that were about infrastructure, uh, egresses for fire, uh, the ability to absorb 
hundreds of more people daily and just that kind of density in that area over the viaduct. As far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, none of those have been addressed. There is no other um, viaduct over the railroad tracks. There is no other egresses. Nothing has been addressed. And um, if you look at that picture or any of these pictures that we've seen tonight, I think you would be hard pressed to say, yes, that fits into the neighborhood environment. Surrounded by parking lots, there's nothing about that development that speaks to the neighborhood or integrates in any way with the neighborhood. Massive buildings, that was the developer's own language in there. Um, I'm concerned a little bit about the ease. She's saying how the city has made this process so easy for her. I'd like to see the planning of this city, of this valley, be a little less easy for developers, but a little more inclusive of what really needs to happen here. We need affordable housing. I'm not NIMBY, I'm all for it. Let's have affordable housing. But does this plan also speak to the climate change plan? Uh, uh, stick and uh, the kind of building that they're proposing here uh, the way that building is done generally all over the place here has 30% waste built in, 30% waste. Why aren't we encouraging some kind of hybrid, alternative building, some cooperative? We're talking about deed-restricted housing for low income or affordable housing. These are all rental units which we know do not contribute to uh, wealth accumulation except for the developers. So the developers come in exploiting a need. We need affordable housing. And they go to all of these ends to make it look like this is going to be the answer, but this is not the answer. This is contributing to the problem before we've solved the answers of how do we absorb thousands of more people living in all of these communities in given the resources that we have today. Why don't we, and this is just my idea, if I had millions and billions of dollars in developing, I would buy all of that property next to super number one that all goes to the way to the old hospital. All of that could be developed with gardens and community areas, and that is also close to downtown. Also doesn't have the same logistical problems of the viaduct and the north end of town with absolute lack of, uh, of exits for the wildfire seasons that we know are getting worse and worse and worse. For the planning, I would like to see some vision. I would like to see the last best place not just be cut up and marketed away and sold off until we are just like every other town that was unable to put an actual imprint of what we want this community to be able to grow as because of people taking advantage of the fact that we need affordable housing, yes. Yesterday, it's true. But doing these kind of projects, one after the other, it's like all the storage units that line the whole valley. Who looks in that, driving through, and thinks that was a good idea? You have the opportunity now to shape the future of Whitefish. Don't build something that in three years, or five years, or three months, you're going to be very disappointed in the results of this decision. Please increase the infrastructure that we need and work together with developers who are not only interested in extracting money from this area, but are interested in being community partners with what we actually need in our development of the whole valley. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. <clears throat> How's it going? Good evening. My name is Frank Salfo, and I'm the property owner. I have two multifamilies on 725 and 729 Waverly. Um, I've been developing in this town for a few years, so I understand what you guys are up against. I think what you guys are doing is a very reasonable project. Um, two things that kind of stand out um, with me kind of being an owner over there. Uh, Frank, one, could you just come a little closer oh, to the sorry. mic, please? One, one is the uh, the lighting uh, that's going to come off of this property. Uh, there was a multifamily that was built right at the end of Waverly on Colorado about three years ago. And every evening when we're walking home from downtown and we see that three-story uh, multifamily that maybe has, I don't know, 50 units in there, it's just lit up. 
So uh, during the day, I think this project's gonna look great and it's gonna integrate into the community well. But at nighttime, I think it's gonna be really bright. So something for the developer to take into consideration, how are they going to reduce the lighting once uh, it gets dark out. Um, secondly, along those lines, uh, fencing. I know the fencing is probably not in the uh, landscaping requirements, but uh, just to have some consideration for maybe the 21 houses on the south side there, Waverly, um, during the whole development project, to have a, a builder go ahead and put up a few hundred feet of uh, fencing, I think would be a really good uh, way to show that you guys are working with the community. So, um, and I think I heard a four foot fence maybe being a minimum, that might be just a little too small. I know along uh, my backyard there was a big berm, a big earth berm that was built up. So maybe if the developer can kinda uh, use some earth uh, in lieu of fencing, that might be a way to um, create some privacy and to avoid headlights shining into back of all the, the housing there. And then uh, lastly, even though this might not affect us directly, um, I think the proposed area for the snow removal is uh, a bit unrealistic. Uh, just in our two units, when we have snow uh, being removed, uh, it doesn't take much to accumulate an eight foot pile real quick. So in just the little areas that I see marked off green there, um, I, I think that those proposed areas are pretty unrealistic. Uh, but besides that, um, I think everything is just in line with how whitefish is growing. And um, I wish you luck. Thanks, Frank. My name is Dakota Whitman. I live at 102 Dakota Avenue, ironically. But <laughs> so I wanted to kind of zoom out a bit with this project. And while it's easy to get lost in the details and in the minutia, which are important and need to be addressed, um, for folks like me, I am a renter. I don't own property in Whitefish, but I do live here. I work here. I volunteer here. And for folks like me, like, I am fortunate enough to be in a relatively stable renting situation. And if that were to change, I would be forced out of town. I would have to probably leave the whole valley, <laughs> to be honest with you. And so I just want to zoom out a little and remind people that for the many, many people in Whitefish like me, this is not a matter of convenience or inconvenience. This is a matter of if I can even be a part of this community, period. Thank you. Thanks, Dakota. Hello, my name is Hannah Farrell. I live at 310 West 6th Street in Whitefish, and actually I was kicked out of 809 Waverly Place when the landlords decided to sell the house. I later was kicked out of 122 Montana Avenue uh, because the landlord decided to sell that as well. So piggybacking off of Dakota, um, just I know that people like to talk about single family homes being ideal for renters, and yes, if you have a dog, that's great but I think having dedicated rentals that have no possibility of later being sold out from under the tenants is very valuable. Um, I also think the location of this place would be perfect. Um, it's walkable, bikeable, can densely house people, and it's close to the snow bus. Um, people have argued that uh, the development will exacerbate traffic issues. Um, I briefly lived um, on the other side of Wisconsin by the Alpenglow apartments, and I didn't notice that there. Um, so I hope that if slash when this goes in, it won't be as much of a traffic headache as people are scared it may be. Um, I know that NIMBYs are really pushing to shut down this project, and I really hope it goes through. I think it's well thought out, and we need this affordable housing yesterday. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Anyone else wish to speak on this matter? Okay, we will uh, reserve about five minutes for the developer to address any of the public comments that you wish to. That would be great, thank you. Um, I would like to address a couple things. One, um, we are, and again, I'm the architect speaking on behalf of the developer, but <coughs> we're happy to work with staff with the conditions of approval that they've listed, including the fencing of the property. 
um, the dark sky lighting for the property, those types of things that have come up repeatedly as concerns from the neighbors. We're happy to work with staff on that as a condition of approval. Um, the, uh, I'm trying to hit some of the, the high points that people talked about. The small building on Colorado, there actually is several, there's, there are several three-story buildings right in that area. So that's why that remained a three-story building, even though it's a much smaller footprint. So we felt that it did have a relationship to um, structures already existing on Colorado. As um, just south of the, and we called it 16-foot wide alley. We know it's not that wide, but that's the right of way. That's the right of way. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so there are, there is a three-story multifamily building just on the south side of that in that eastern or western half as well. So we did look at the context and the scale of the buildings. Um, and the, the Texas side is more of a mix of, of two-story buildings. There are no three stories over there, hence the two-story building uh, facing um, Texas. Groundwater, obviously any new development has to go through engineering. Um, and my comment about working with staff, they have been wonderful because they will answer our questions and they will give us very pointed feedback. Um, they're not pushovers. They know what needs to happen in this community. They know how the engineering has to be correct. Obviously, we'll have a soils engineer, sill engineers, um, utility engineers that work out all of these issues. And it's unfortunate, it's kind of in an interim state right now that's creating impacts. But um, obviously, the engineering is there so that those impacts um, are mitigated with the, with the development. And lastly, there, you know, as communities, we're passionate about affordable housing, but um, the PUD is what's allowing this, com this um, new component of the community to provide that 30% affordable housing. So it's a very big deal. Um, if it was just developed under straight zoning today, that would go away, it would just be housing. And so we feel that it's important enough um, with those 900 homes that are needed now to fill that need to get the teachers, get the firefighters, get the nurses, get get folks that work in all the great businesses in Whitehead, White Whitefish. I'm thinking Flathead and Whitefish all together, um, because it is an ecosystem, right? The Flathead Valley is an ecosystem, and so how does the community really do its part to support that? Um, so I, that's all I wanted to address. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question for you. Certainly. Um, the the height variance that's included in the Legacy Homes Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain how this development is using that, you know, what amount of density is provided through that height variance and what would the impacts be on the number of units or the number of affordable units if you didn't Ooh. accept that variance? Um, so that's what's allowing us to go to the three stories, right? So we can have some variety in the roof planes um, we didn't want these buildings to feel like just horizontal boxes. We want the roof to have some movement and some quality of character to it so that you don't have a flat top line. And so that extra five feet of variation is what allows us to do that. Could we squish it in there? Um, most likely, but I think architecturally when it's all said and done, and people are living here and, and it's part of the community, I think we'd look back and go, oh, yeah, it would have been nicer if we just let the architecture move a little bit. So that's, it's an important component to, to make it a really nice you know, community. And it's not really a variance that we're asking for, it just is one of those offerings, if you will. Yeah, it's part of the bonus that they get for offering the affordable housing. And Alpenglow, the one that was built on Edgewood, took the same exact issue. It wasn't, wasn't really to increase density. It was just to increase the variety of what they were building. Any other questions for Lori? Go ahead, Whitney. Uh, what's the reasoning behind two exits onto Texas? Would it be possible to have only one on the north side? Um, you might lose a few parking spots, it looks like, if you don't, but I think it is a travesty to have this one homeowner blocked in by a, a huge building and a parking lot on the other side. Um, and I know that for the good of the community, sure, maybe one homeowner is 
trapped in, but that's part of being neighborly is looking at this. And so I'm just wondering what is the benefit of two exits on Texas? The the second, the southern one, mm -hmm. really gives us a secondary access from a life safety standpoint on Texas and gives us great access through the community. Um, the building to the north is a two-story building, so it's in relationship to the rest of the massing of the building in terms of height. Mm -hmm. um, the building to the west, we have pushed it back. There is a, a significant setback, and that home on its property has quite a few big trees that surround that house. Mm -hmm. And so we felt between the, the two-story to the north, the pushback of the three-story oh, three building and their existing vegetation that the impact um, wouldn't be any greater because of those two buildings' proximity. So without that second exit, you don't have enough of an access for emergency vehicles? Is that what you're saying? or? No. no, it just, it, it cleans it up. <laughs> and we'd have to go back and work with, with fire and engineering to see if that was a possibility, but um, we felt it was better for the community. And as far as snow placement, um, the comment from your neighbor who also owns a few small rentals um, in the area, have you consulted with anyone on the amount of snow removal you'll be doing for these hundreds of parking spots and the amount of area that you're reserving to put that snow? So at the PUD level, we haven't gotten into, you know, cubic yards of snow mm -hmm. because, you know, you get into that level of detail, it's like, well, our fingers are crossed that the community sees the value and approves this tonight as a, mm -hmm. as a PUD application. Um, but, you know, we want to function, right? Mm -hmm. We want the community to function. And so at the end of the day, um, management is going to really look at that. This, is, this isn't, um, you know, a play where they're building it to sell it off. This is an ownership play and a commitment to the community with the deed restriction of affordable housing. So we want it to work. Um, and if it has to increase, then we'd have to figure that out. And I ask most of this because the community is here, and I think it's important for us to have a dialogue with you for, you know, people who feel like this is happening and maybe there's not enough community involvement or they just got a notice. You know, they really do want affordable housing but want more insight into this. So, you know, not to be adversarial, I just want to know no, if absolutely. there are different things that could be happening or if there's a specific safety reason why something's happening. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions for Lori? Okay. I do have one more, sorry. Okay. So okay. it sounded like you were saying <clears throat> you guys will be willing and happy to put fencing up yes. along the alley and then mm -hmm. potentially the north parking lot mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. We, we had left it off thinking maybe the community would like the openness, mm -hmm. but absolutely, you know, it's come up as a, a condition of approval. Okay. So that's perfectly fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Mm -hmm. All right, at this point we will close the public hearing um, and uh, reserve some questions for staff, because I have a few. Does anybody else want to start? Okay, go ahead. Uh, just for my reference, and I apologize, I, I know you may not know offhand, but the height variance that we gave at Alpenglow and the height variance that we gave at Skiles Place Apartments I'm just curious if we can reference those. I don't think the Skiles Place has a variance for height. That was predates our legacy home program. They just did a conditional use permit, so they must be 35 feet or less. It was a condition. I don't remember. But you can't ask for a yeah. zoning deviation to a, with a CUP, so I think they okay. just they meet the zoning. Um, and then the Alpenglow, I think they went a little higher. They asked yeah. for a height deviation. 45. Again, that predates 45. our, that's what I was thinking, 45? I think it was, it might have been 45, yeah. Hmm. I don't remember exactly. But, but that predates <laughs> the legacy home where you're just yeah. eligible for it by providing it. So they did, I think that back building that's in the north 
west corner that's like a three story. I think that one's a bit taller because they okay. have three levels there. But off okay. the top of my head, I don't know. Thank you. It helps to reference construction we've seen recently. Thank you, Andy. I, I remember pretty specifically that that was about being able to being able to break up the roof lines yeah. and not yeah. not about fitting more stuff in. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I have several questions for staff. First of all, um, Craig, can you talk about uh, what we require in terms of a stormwater plan that would not be in place out there in its current form on that property? Yes, yeah, so our engineering standards will require that this site be held to its pre-development um, runoff um, quantity and quality, so both um, water treatment and you know water capture and slow release. Um, to meet the 100 year storm requirement. And so um, we'll review that, you know, against the engineering standards to make sure that the water coming off this site, once it's developed, matches the water coming off the site prior to when they started filling it. So we consider that filling that took place part of the development. So we'll have to go back and look at um, and model the, the runoff from the project uh, and the land mass before any uh, soil was uh, exported onto the site. Okay, and is it it's pretty likely that They would have to have some sort of under under underground catchment system. Do you think on that? Property or you know, I think it'll probably be a combination of surface storage and subsurface storage in okay. order to meet Meet that standard, but there's a considerable amount of impervious surface that's coming along with this project. So um, There will definitely be quite a bit of storage required. Okay, and there will be a, they, they'll have to do a fully engineered stormwater plan, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, uh, Wendy, there's no there's no condition of approval that requires them to intersperse the the deed restricted housing throughout. That's one of the legacy home requirements. Okay. As they phase the project, they'll phase the number of units in the building and the type and mix. That's just one of the requirements. So that's already accounted for yeah. in that. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that yeah, they we won't all just going to build building. one of the buildings, right. reserve one of them for that, because that's not, that's not the intent. Mm -mm. Right. No. Okay. Um, and then buffering and fencing. Is that going to, is fencing part of the, it's not part, is it part of the landscape, the new landscaping plan? I can't remember. No, it's, um, it's like so many trees per so many feet and so many shrubs and they have to be a certain height and a certain kind of um, fill in like density kind of, of for a buffer. Okay. Um, and there's a number of fences kind of along um, the south part of Waverly. There's kind of folks have put in fences over the years. Not everybody has a fence. And then when you kind of come around the corner where there's more of the multifamily on the western half, there's less fencing. Yeah. Um, so we were thinking folks would be more concerned with headlights in the winter time shining into their backyards. So if we could mitigate the headlights along with five feet of um, dense landscaping, that that would be a suitable buffer. Okay. So they didn't get a deviation to the landscaping installation requirement. It's just the width of it. Okay. Um, but fencing is something that we could potentially reserve as a condition of approval. Yeah. And, you know, be complicated because, again, there are a number of fences kind of along that north line with the north parking lot. So do they put in a fence when there's already a fence or upgrade the fence or... That's why we were thinking something that blocks headlights, you know, would, you know, whether it's a wall or a low fence or some berming or something integrated with landscaping might be a better buffer, but I guess I leave that up to you. Okay. I think um, getting a landscape architect on board to look at that would be helpful. And that would be, you know, what would happen at the time of building permit. And does the, do the current conditions account for making sure that we buffer this as well as we can, or do we need to kind of massage the language a little bit to well they're going to meet the buffering requirements in the landscaping chapter okay that is the landscaping buffering i mean i think the other thing you know we don't know the final grade of the site you know is it going to be you know lower higher undulating right. i don't know so that was that's kind of the other part i was thinking it'd be good to wait until see that final grading comes into place and then work with them to you know block headlights 
but if you want something higher, I well, think we it can. seems like we it seems like there's enough concern among the community that we would want to add a condition that addresses the buffering a little more um, effectively. I guess is the best word I'm looking for there. Right now, let me find the conditions. So here. it's B on page twenty, condition number nine F. Okay. That the landscaping plan submitted with the application for building permit, because that's when we read landscaping, review landscaping plans, um, that we would have an overall landscaping, parking lot landscaping, open space plan for active, active and passive recreation, tree retention. And then I put in a low wall no taller than four feet along the edges of the parking lot installed to prevent headlights from trespassing onto adjacent properties. So I think you could okay. probably strike that and just say a six foot wall around the perimeter of the entire project or. Well, I, I'd like it to, I'd like it to be a little more flexible than just saying a, a six foot wall or whatever, or eight foot wall, whatever it would be. Um, all right, we can think about that once we have a motion, um, or let me think about it for a minute. And uh, in terms of lighting, mm -hmm. our dark sky compliant is the best we've got in the city, right? And they'll have to meet those requirements of dark sky. Yeah, so dark sky is that lights shine down, but I think we could probably do better and provide also some shielding along the exterior. Okay, and that is that is one of the conditions of approval, correct? Right, and that's A, 9A, submit a. a lighting cut sheet and other design materials to ensure all outdoor lighting standards are met, including preventing glare onto neighboring properties. Okay, so that is accounted for in those conditions. Okay. Um, and the only other thing I just want to make sure is that you know, there is this concern that we can't, that we shouldn't build north of the viaduct until we have an infrastructure improvements in terms of our roads. Craig, is there anything you can address on that front that, um, about plans, future plans, how it's going to get better based on what we're doing or what we've worked out with BNSF or what we might be working out with BNSF? Yeah, I guess a couple things. One, I can tell you that we um, are working with BNSF on a, um, a grant application for, in fact, we've already submitted the grant application for a railroad crossing elimination um, study, which would presumably look at all of our existing railroad crossings all the way from State Park Road to East 2nd Street. Um, if there's any possibility of eliminating at grade crossings there through either an underpass or an overpass or the creation of a new um, separated grade crossing. Um, and so we'll be working on that. We haven't received um, news of that grant yet, but I think we have a pretty good chance of getting it and that'll at least kick off the study to start looking at that. Um, we're also working with the Montana Department of Transportation on a variety of different projects on Wisconsin Avenue and um, Bob Vosen, who's the director of this region of MDT, will actually be here at a city council work session, I believe in July, um, to, to talk about some of those projects. And you know that'll be a really good chance for council and staff to interface directly with MDT. But um, you know we've looked at everything from, from widening on uh, Wisconsin Avenue to creation of medians and turn lanes, um, you know, to other projects. So. Um, unfortunately, Wisconsin Avenue is not um, a city right of way. It's a it's a secondary state highway, uh, and we receive for the state receives very little funding for that stretch um, through the Urban Fund program. Um, once you turn onto Big Mountain Road, it becomes a, a a state highway again, and so that's why we've seen considerable improvement on Big Mountain Road. Um, you can very quickly identify where that transition from secondary to primary <laughs> state highway is. Um, but I, we'll be working with MDT and we'll continue to, you know, have those conversations. Yeah, we, we have been working through that in terms of what's going to be best, whether it's a three lane with a turn lane or whatever it is, right? Right. Okay. Um, and then I know you're not police or fire, but this, the second driveway on the south end off onto Texas on the east side of this development, 
Um, what is your assessment of that? Is that something that would definitely be necessary? I mean, I know you can't speak for the for the emergency services, but in terms of a yeah, engineer. Yeah, I mean, not speaking on behalf of police, fire, um, or rescue, but you know, with the density in this subdivision with 146 units, um, if for some reason there is an emergency in the center of the site and it requires multiple jurisdictions to respond um, and one of those two accesses on Texas are blocked, we're creating a considerably higher level of risk, um, you know, for the folks living there. So I definitely feel a lot more comfortable with, with three means of access to um, a development of this size. Okay. I, I'd add to that um, we hear them um, pretty regularly telling us that they need to get within 150 feet of all edges of buildings, so they definitely are going to need that other access. Okay. And they don't like to back up. They like to go, you know, it's just easier for maneuvering. And right. Yeah, I would definitely say that they're going to need that secondary access. Would something like what we have uh, proposed at the snow lot with a um, non-asphalt graded, uh, paved access with a gate, would that be something that would be... They aren't super popular with the fire department because okay. they tend to not be maintained during the winter. You know, people gate them and then they forget about them, but they do need to be plowed, and so they get pretty concerned about, you know, that kind of use. Okay, all right. Okay, those are all the questions I have. Anybody else? Okay, I guess it's time for a motion. I move to approve WPUD 22-04 with um, all of the added conditions for approval. And I'll go ahead and second that. Um, I would like to add a friendly amendment if you'd be so kind. Okay. Uh, my amendment would be to revise uh, condition 9F, and I'm not sure what exactly uh, we would but the, the general gist of it would be to allow flexibility for a wall, a higher than four foot wall. And maybe we just strike uh, the first part of that and just say a wall, to, a wall along the edge of the parking lot must be installed to prevent headlighting, headlight from trespassing into adjacent properties. Could we, sorry, uh, say a fence or wall? Fence or wall, sure, yeah. So that is a friendly amendment motion. It would need a second for us to talk about it. Okay, so that's moved and seconded. Um, <clears throat> any further discussion on that? I, I think hopefully it will help alleviate some concerns of the neighbors. Your mic. Uh, just hopeful that will help alleviate some concerns of uh, the neighbors who have spoken tonight. Um, it sounds like the applicant is very willing to work with staff and may be receptive to some of the comments you've heard tonight. Um, so I think that additionally conditioning it, conditioning it with that is wise and beneficial. Okay. Those in favor of the amendment, unless anybody want to speak oh, on it? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say I, I just have the concern of walling off, you know, <laughs> a high density development that's a block away from the railroad and then it seems like we, you know, the the opportunity to talk with the neighbors while you're getting in your car and kind of get to be more integrated in the neighborhood is diminished. Um, whereas I... Hey, and excuse me, Sorry. excuse me, we will maintain and order in here, please. I, I don't know if the four foot high wall, you know, I mean, that seems to maybe address it, but I wonder if this is something that could be more open to the community and discussed with the developer or something where they could look at more options for what might fit the community the most. I just feel like fencing off the entire project with like a six or eight foot high wall might be a lot, but I don't know that that's something that we should delineate exactly the height at all, so there's okay. just a consideration there. Okay, uh, I don't think we had a, we had we didn't have a number in that right. friendly amendment. Right. But we did require a wall or a fence, which yeah. to your point is, go ahead Whitney. So, 
in my mind, you need something lower to block light, and then it would be nice to have something higher to create privacy for neighbors who don't want a parking lot directly behind. Um, and also for people getting into their cars, maybe they don't want to look directly into someone's backyard. And so I think if we could word it that there's a combination of a low structure, that could be an earth berm, that could be a four foot wall, something that's lower that's light blocking and continuous, but then a combination of either an attractive fence or dense vegetation that could create a privacy screen. So making a condition that has a two-part screen, one that's light blocking for the headlights and then one that's attractive and taller and that can be vegetation or a fence. So four foot light blocking, six foot privacy giving. Could we amend the amendment just we, instead of talking about height, just, you know, like you said, but then it, to, yes. to, to address blocking light and privacy? Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for what that might sound like, Wendy? I, I have an idea. Uh, so right now we have something that says a wall or fence along the edges of the parking lot must be installed. What if we have, what if we say something like buffering um, along the edges of the parking lot must be installed to prevent headlight headlights from trespassing onto adjacent properties and provide privacy um, along uh, well I mean we have pri provide privacy adjacent to uh, neighboring properties mm -hmm. housing neighboring housing adjacent housing. Does that make sense? No. Yes. I mean, some of that's redundant in comparison to our landscaping requirements, isn't it? Is some of that redundant to our landscape requirements? So, Steve, you said buffering along edges of parking lot must be installed to prevent headlights from trespassing onto adjacent properties and to provide privacy for adjacent housing. All right. That's yes. That's pretty much what I said. Is that clear enough for you, applicant? Okay. All right. Um, what's that? Yeah, unfortunately, the public comment period is closed. Um, there, there will be another shot at this at City Council. Um, if you have uh, questions, there is time in between to ask those questions or to provide questions to the City Council for when this comes back up at City Council. Uh, but I am reluctant to reopen the public comment at this point um, regarding this one issue. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but this is not a discussion period for this. That's not the way that the planning, meet, planning board meetings work. Um, the, the planning board meetings are here to, um, for you to address the, the, the planning board uh, regarding, the, um, regarding the project. And if you did not speak during the public comment period, that's your one chance to do that other than to provide written comments to us. And then this will also go with a recommendation either to approve or not approve. It'll go to city council and the city council will consider it as well. So, and the city council will have final say on it. So if you didn't speak tonight, you still have one more chance and you can always send us um, letters as well. So uh, we do have a, we have an amendment, friendly amendment on the table. Um, any further discussion on that? Did we butcher it enough for everybody's, to everybody's liking? Okay. Uh, those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. So that passes unanimously. So now we're back to the original motion. John, did you have an additional friendly amendment or was that was your? Okay. All right. Um, any other comments about this project before we have our vote? You made the motion, Allison, so we'll give you the first crack. Uh, yeah, I think 
Acknowledging the public comment that we heard with the traffic and infrastructure issues, obviously this is one of our most common concerns that we hear about, especially with the high density development, and we're all concerned about it. I live on the north side of the viaduct, um, and it's very frustrating. And I think, as Steve mentioned, it's it's not something that that can ever be pinned on on one development in order to fix that issue. There's so many different processes with the state um, that must be followed in order to address that. I hope that as a community, we can elevate that issue so that our infrastructure can be addressed as we as we continue to make appropriate developments in our town. Um, with that said, I think, um, you know, evaluating all of the comment and the application, um, it, it is appropriate in fill in the place and the deed restricted units is a great benefit to the community and something that um, we are not able to re require anymore as a city but should technically be a requirement for, for developments that we allow. Um, and so I think that that's obviously the highest, most important issue of all that's being addressed here. And I think that this can make a big impact on our, on our housing needs in the city. Anyone else? Um, I just, I wanna add a few comments um, here just so that we have some perspective about what the developer is offering to the city. Um, and I'll get to that in a second, but I would like to, I just want to address, I do understand the frustration with not feeling like you get to have a back and forth with the, with the planning board regarding certain issues. Um, unfortunately, that's not the nature of this forum for that. Um, I would encourage the developer to maybe hold a community meeting so that you can talk with them if you haven't already, uh, meet with the, the people who can get together and talk with you about what their concerns are and how you can address those concerns in between now and when this goes to council. Um, and there may be some changes that, that come along um, from those discussions. Um, but I do certainly understand that it's difficult to, when you don't feel like you get to have um, a back and forth with us regarding these things. But that's, that is, that's just the way our process works. And unfortunately, that's just how it is. Um, and it's, uh, it's, not a, it's just not a forum for a back and forth conversation regarding those things. Uh, it's more a chance for you to give us comments and then we can, if we deem that those are important enough to talk with staff about, we will raise those with staff and staff will give us their best answer on those things. And I think we addressed pretty much all of the concerns that were brought up tonight. Um, so uh, the, the other things that I do want to just, I want to bring up um, come from the housing refresh of 2022 last year. Uh, because I think we need that, this perspective in our community that um, and we don't really hear it all the time. Uh, and we, we feel it, but we m maybe don't know um, what it's actually like. So the median listed rent in Whitefish right now is $3,000 a month. Uh, so you would have to have an income of about $9,000 a month to afford to, to rent a place at that level. 57%, uh, and I think Mallory brought up this point, 57% of the people who work in Whitefish commute into our city. That's about 3,500 people per day that commute into our city. And we need to make a dent in that. Somebody brought up the climate action plan. Yes, part of our climate action plan is important that we allow people, that we have provide housing for people that want to live and work in our town because that reduces emissions. Um, <clears throat> so um, by providing 44 affordable units, that's gonna provide 44 places where people that live in town don't um, have to commute into town uh, to, to come in and work. Um, it, by 2030, which is not that far away, uh, we need 588 below market rate apartments in this town. This is a big chunk of that. It's almost 10% or, you know, it's like 8% or something like that. Um, and just to give some perspective, these are deed restricted to 60%, 60 to 80% of AMI, which as, we, as it stands today, 60% uh, of AMI is, is $1,015 a month. Um, 80, and that, that's what the rent would be um, limited to. 80% uh, is 1350 a month. Uh, there are a lot of people that could um, qualify for this that want to live and work here in this community. And if we do not, if, if this community um, does not start finding ways to provide this, and I have lots of other ideas for how to do that, 
Um, one of the solutions is to have developers come in and, and give us their best guess at what they can give. 30% is the biggest I've seen from any development proposal um, in the last probably 10 years sitting up here, other than the, um, the place over by, um, the place over off of Orman that's 100% deed restricted. Well, it's not quite 100% anymore. Um, but those are single family homes. So, but we need rentals too. And this, this goes a long way in providing some of those rentals. Uh, and as a community, we have said over and over again that we support affordable housing. With that come some inconveniences as well, and we just have to accept that. If we are going to put our money where our mouth is and provide housing for the people that want to live and work here, we are all going to have to deal with the inconvenience. I don't like driving north of the viaduct. I don't, it's kind of dangerous riding my bike on Wisconsin now too, and it never used to be. Um, but it, it is something we all have to deal with, and we all share, we all have to share in that burden as well. Uh, and that's what it means to live in a community. And I think that this project goes a long way in helping us with that. Um, there are a lot of things that we'll have to pencil out and be done by the developer before any ground gets moved out there. Uh, but providing 30% of their project in, in a deed restricted affordable housing will go a long way in helping us with our housing crisis that we have here. So for those reasons, I will be um, voting for this. Um, any other comments? Okay, all those in favor, aye. Aye, aye. opposed, nay. And the, um, passes unanimously, and this will go to City Council. On I the 19th. On the 19th, yeah, I saw I that change. Yeah, yeah, June 19th. So not the next meeting, but the, um, but the, the second meeting in June. This will be on the Council meeting. So if you did not get a chance to participate tonight, you can certainly come and participate then. Um, I also um, encourage you to write letters. Uh, the City Council does take into account all of those letters uh, that people write to us, okay? Uh, and with that, we are done with our public hearings. We're on to good and welfare matters from the board. Any matters from the board for staff? Okay, seeing nothing, matters from staff. Anything for us? Where do we stand with the growth policy update stuff? So we're currently working on the public participation plan. Um, as you probably know, the governor signed a bunch of bills yesterday that are going to affect our, our ability to put together a growth policy. It's going to affect, um, you know, there's a new bill that requires ADUs up to 1,000 square feet in every district. There's a new bill that requires us to uh, permit multifamily by right on every commercial zone in the city. Um, so we're going to be scrambling to kind of figure out and um, what all the zoning changes we need to bring forward. Um, but one of the next step for the growth policy is bringing that public participation plan to the city council. It needs to be adopted by resolution per the new state law 382 that was passed. So, um, um, it will probably be can't... August before we do our, um, big kickoff meeting at this point, we're still trying to figure out, you know, all the ramifications of what's going on. Do we have to change our TikTok policy at all, um, with regards <laughs> to the, with the plan? You might have to you close your account, Steve. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dave. So everything's kind of on hold until we sort through what we have to do versus... Yeah, we'll probably have a work session with the council to talk about the legislative stuff and where we're at with the growth policy okay. pretty soon. All right. So nothing is imminent on the growth policy at this point. Okay. Um, all right. Um, anything else? Okay. Uh, June 15th meeting, those who will be here. I will not be here June 15th. I will be in South Carolina with my family. Whitney. Okay. Uh, so we'll have to reach out to um, the other guys that are not here tonight and figure out who's, who can be here and who can't. Uh, and then we'll have to choose a second vice chair, I guess. Allison, Whitney. Okay. You can arm wrestle over it? Okay. <laughs> we, could do, we could settle it now or you can just wait until that meeting. So just to clarify, we don't have any additional work session planned for the June meeting. And do we know about July yet or we'll wait to see later? Yeah, we probably won't have one in July. We may do something in August. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Right now, I will nominate Whitney to be our vice chair at the next meeting if um, no one else can do it. And then if 
you decide that you want to make Allison do it, I'll let you decide that. Uh, okay. Uh, that's it. All we need is a motion to adjourn. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>